he's so so vain. He's he's so so vain. Subscribe. Donate. Ring a bell. Go to hell. Aloha, ladies and germs. Welcome to another He's So Me. Um, a funny thing happened on the way to making this ep- Well, a funny thing happened to make this episode. And then a funny thing happened on the way to making it. Um, a friend of mine who I trust on such subjects told me that in last week's episode, uh, I was a little too hard on Dr. Gary Nolan and that he is the real deal. Um, he does have a lot of clout in his profession. And, uh, you know, maybe I need to dial it back and actually thank him for, um, for instance, I had mentioned that Greer, uh, Stephen Greer had that documentary on the mummy that turned out not to be an alien, the Ada, I think it was, or something, mummy. Um, and that was Gary Nolan. He was, um, charged with, uh, or hired to, or whatever. Uh, to examine that, and, and despite what, you know, I'm sure everyone working on the documentary wanted him to say, he told the truth, which is, it seems to be human. Um, so we have him to thank for killing that before it ever got out of the gate, um, as a, a mysterious object. People. <laughs> um, so thanks, Gary. And also, I'll go one step further in my reading up on him, um... Uh, I found that he also, in his looking at metamaterials from alleged UFO crashes, um, he was able to say that at least one, which was presented by, what's his name, the Blink-182 guy from To The Stars Academy, uh, that that one was not anything uh, that couldn't be explained, um, which just leaves this one metamaterial he's been looking at from a UFO crash out of Brazil or something south america somewhere um you can see how much research i've done and retained <laughs> here's the problem I've, i think i've said this on the show um i really have stopped paying attention to the new ufological characters since 2017 since the reboot the ufological reboot uh so i only i know them peripherally like lou elizondo clearly i know the name can't tell you what organization he worked for. Neither can he, because apparently he keeps or has been sort of fudging the acronyms and stuff um, and and what he did under said acronym. You know, so there are peripheral, you know, characters who have become like forefront characters. And I, I just I only know bits and pieces. I don't really like study them. And Gary Nolan is one of these to me because I don't care about metamaterials. Um, but. I do care about whether or not someone is gaslighting me. And I went into this, this is the funny thing that happened on the way to making this episode. I went into it thinking like, okay, I will take my friend up on the challenge. I will watch an interview with Gary Nolan and I will do a he's so vainy about that. And um, I decided to do the Tucker Carlson interview because then I can also make my progressive, you know, take that stance against ever going on Tucker Carlson and, you know, what, what it is at the right wing media, why they love this UFO stuff so much and, and then point that out and what Carlson says. Um, and so I had my little time codes for various spots that I agreed or disagreed with Gary Nolan, you know, the usual, but as I'm watching something struck me, which is like, even in my not really knowing about Gary Nolan, I can never seem to actually retain Gary Nolan. There are certain people like Lou Elizondo, who I, I can't retain them because there's something, it seems shady, or like, I associate him with metamaterials, but he's not a metallurgist, he's not, he, you know, his background isn't, doesn't scream metametals, uh, and I had heard that he was an experiencer, um, and I know about the, um, I knew about the Greer, the Greer thing, and I think that was, you know, examining that material was more his background so i guess, I guess what i'm saying is I, I find him kind of confusing and as i'm watching the tucker carlson interview i'm thinking okay obviously he's on to talk about the metamaterials the ufo crash stuff because this is 
from 2022, this interview. And uh, what else could they have? Um, I'll, I'll, let's just stick a pin in it there. Let's just, uh, I want to find out here, because in watching this stuff, it clicked with me, what it is that I feel like he's being shady about. He doesn't look shady, right? He interviews well. He seems like an honest enough guy. But let's see if we can't piece something together. And you tell me if I'm being just a little bit too critical here, a little too crazy. I'll take it. If I am, if I'm wrong or I'm being too critical, let me know. Um, I'm sure you will in the comments section. Um, but let's just take a, a look here at the opener to get a gist of what I'm saying. This is from Dr. Gary P. Nolan, UAP UFO Tucker Carlson, uh, full interview 3822, posted by UAP Tracker. Um, let's just look at the opening sequence here. He's a Harvard, he's a Stanford rather, professor, Stanford PhD, he's an immunologist. And he has, over the last decade or two, spent a lot of time studying the harmful effects that apparent encounters with UFOs have on the human brain. This is a field of study and he is at the very top of it. Dr. Gary Nolan joins us in studio. Professor, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you so much. This is, I was just reading your, your I, again, I just, to restate the same point once more, it's just remarkable once you get into this topic, I don't know if mainstream is the word, but it's not fringe at all. So just to kind of, to, to, to accentuate that point, explain your background for our viewers, if you would. So my main job, my day job at Stanford for the last 30 years uh, has been the development of technologies to look at cancer and blood. And so we've spun a number of companies and sold a number of companies that we started out of my lab. Two of them are actually on NASDAQ. And the idea has always been that if money is coming in from the NIH, we should give back to the public. And so in the process of developing some of these, we developed uh, an instrument called CYTOF, which is really all about studying blood cells at a deeper level than anybody's been able to do before. And so it was circa 2011 or so uh, when some people from the CIA uh, and an aerospace company came to me uh, to ask me for their help uh, on the analysis of some individuals who had been had encountered some anomalous objects, they said. And I mean, they came to my office unannounced uh, and then started laying out pictures and data on the table in front of me. And I honestly thought it was a joke. I thought it was Wait, so you're a Stanford <laughs> professor. OK. So maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he wasn't even qualified to look at the mummy. <laughs> He's an immunologist. Uh, but maybe he is. I don't know. What do I know? I'm not in, I'm not in anything. I'm uh, he's so I, he's so vain. I'm vain is what I am. Um, but. Did you catch that he said that that this happened in 2011? And there's no mention of the Greer thing. So just the CIA people show up out of the blue in 2011 and no Greer thing. Huh? Cause you'd think when you say like, how did you get into this? The Greer thing. <laughs> Cause I think that came first, right? If I go to Gary Nolan's Wikipedia page, we learn that in 2012, Nolan began analysis on the Atacama skeleton. Uh, I'm pausing here because Ada, Atacama, okay, I was close. A corpse from Chile that ufologists had speculated to be of alien origin, but which he later revealed to be a mummified human stillbirth with genetic bone defects and genetic mutations causing deformity. So that was in 2012. Um, according to Nolan, he was approached by, quote, some people representing the government and an aerospace corporation to help them understand the medical harm that had come to some individuals related to supposed interactions with an anomalous craft, end quote, because, quote, they were interested in the kinds of blood analysis that my lab can do, end quote. So here he's clearly talking about that, uh, what he's talking about on, uh, on uh, uh, Tucker Carlson's show here. And if Wikipedia is to be trusted, uh, this happened after 
the Atacama skeleton thing. Doesn't give us a date, but this falls after the 2012 uh, thing that they're talking about here, the Atacama skeleton. So what's what's they came to me in 2011 about? Like, already I'm a little... The math here is a little fuzzy. The dates are a little fuzzy. But let's continue. So you're an immunologist doing medical research and building mm -hmm. companies, and all of a sudden one day the CIA shows up at your office? Because they had asked around and said, okay, we have these people who've been injured, and one of the things that they wanted to do in a complete medical workup of these individuals was to look at the blood. It's a natural thing to do. If you're looking for an inflammation, the blood is one of the places you might look to get a sort of a more complete list of everything that's going on in the body. And so that's when somebody said, well, if you want to do this, do it properly, you've got to go talk to this guy, Nolan, at Stanford, because he has the world's best instrument that he's developed for doing it. And that's what started it. Also, let's just note that he's talking about the CIA coming to him, and at least in, according to Wikipedia, uh, they have him quoted as saying, some people representing the government and an aerospace corporation uh, to help them understand the medical harm that had come to some individuals. So that's slightly different, right? Or a lot different. Um, because some people in the government and an aerospace corporation, uh, what are we talking about here? Bigelow? I mean, are we talking about Bigelow? Are we talking about Bigelow? Just say it. So already, um, you know, uh, my spider senses are tingling here. The next thing, which comes up right after this, or begins to, is his interest in any of this you know, prior to being contacted by these people. Prior to being contacted by these people, I guess he's forgetting about the documentary that made him famous, <laughs> period, uh, outside of whatever his own, you know, professional clique. Uh, but okay, that aside, uh, how did he get into this? Let's see. So what was your view of UFOs, UAPs at the time? You know, I was kind of a science fiction fan and I was interested in it as any mainstream individual might have been. But it wasn't something that I, has, I had any kind of focus on in my so life. So you had no deep knowledge of the topic? No deep knowledge. No deep knowledge of the topic. He's just like you and me. Well, not me. I'm an experiencer. He's just like some of you. Uh, okay, this is where I'm... Like, we're being gaslit here. This is where I'm starting to think like, mm, this isn't adding up. If we go to Stanford Magazine, uh, and I'll have links to these things in the description. You can go look at these yourself. There's an article from July 2023 called First Contact. Gary Nolan is the man you call when there's no earthly explanation. So this is in 2023. Um, and we're going to skip down here. New, 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 new. It says uh, Nolan's introduction to the field was experiential 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 however you pronounce that in an indelible childhood memory nolan recalls seeing an apparent spacecraft above the woods while on his newspaper route in his hometown of windsor connecticut okay so already he's had a ufo sighting just like you and not me in another as a five or six year old he awoke to alien figures in his bedroom. Hmm. Decades later, in a bookstore, he saw the cover of Communion, a true story. Whitley Strieber's best-selling account of his own alleged encounters with aliens. Quote, I just remember having a near-nervous breakdown because it was what I had seen as a child in my bedroom, Nolan says. Those experiences cemented his interest in the extraterrestrial, but they didn't have much effect on Nolan's day-to-day. Then in 2012, he learned that a documentary film crew would have access to a tiny mummified skeleton discovered uh, a decade earlier in the Atacama Desert of northern Chile. Oh, so even Stanford knows about 2012. <laughs> Ada, as the skeleton was nicknamed, okay, so I was right, uh, had an array of unusual physical characteristics, uh, including 10 ribs instead of the usual 12, giant eye sockets and an elongated skull that had fueled rumors it was of alien origin fueled rumors the rumor was stephen greer going around to every concert uh concert practically a concert conference telling us this 
Uh, Nolan, who suspected the skeleton was terrestrial, offered his team services to clarify its provenance. We're going to skip around here. Not long after the release of the documentary, Sirius, in 2013, that's 2013, not 2011, two men stopped by his campus lab. Nolan declines to name them, uh, but says one claimed to be an ex-CIA, I'm sorry, to be ex-CIA, the other an executive with an aerospace company. They came carrying MRIs, showing brain scans of pilots, intelligence agents, and others suffering from a host of ailments whose possible causes included alleged proximity to UFOs. Uh, so, okay, now we've got a timeline that he didn't give us. 2012, he does the documentary. 2013, here come the aerospace ex-CIA people. Nothing about 2011. But in his retelling here, again, he, he forgets, he skips, he pushes back the date of the important thing that he's talking to Tucker about now, which to me is weird because I thought it would be Metamedals, but okay, we're talking about this other thing, and he's skipping over the documentary. Now, you might want to skip over the documentary, I don't know, if it's embarrassing in some way, because it didn't quite work out, but this isn't about that, right? This is about how he uh, got exposed to ufology in the first place. But oh, right, wait a minute. This isn't even it, because he's an experiencer from childhood. And he at least saw, and let's be honest, then read, Communion by Whitley Strieber, which gave him a near mental breakdown. So he, we, he's at least seen one UFO. He's at least had one abduction-like experience, perhaps an actual abduction, something that so affected him he had a near mental breakdown. But no, he's just a common everyday person who just got into this because these people came to him mysteriously in 2011, question mark? No, 2013. Oh, after a movie was made. And then these people are like, he's on their radar. They, they know who he is. And, you know, what would be more interesting, as my, my friend who got me to do this show in the first place said, uh, you know, like, why wouldn't he, I mean, he didn't say this part, I'm just asking it, why wouldn't he add to his resume the fact that he did in debunk the Ada skeleton? Uh, wouldn't that be good for the resume to be like, see, I'm an impartial juror here. But no, he just takes it out altogether, which I find suspicious. And then he wants us to believe he's a normal everyday person, uh, when in fact he's an experiencer. But maybe I'm being a little too tough on him. Maybe he is um, afraid of the repercussions of saying I'm an experiencer. It sounds like in the world that you live in, it is taken for granted, which is assumed to be true, that this stuff is, is real. Yes. Yeah, it's 100% real. I mean, there's just no doubt about it. I mean, the data is real. And this is what I, when I have these conversations with other scientists who have told me, Gary, you're going to ruin your reputation. It's like, well, I, I, I've, my reputation has been always going against the grain and look at where I am. I'm perfectly fine going against the grain. Uh, this is real and we need to pay attention to it. And it's just unscientific to not study it. Yes. Amen. Yeah. Amen, Gary. Huh. So I guess uh, you're not afraid. <laughs> I guess you would admit to it. You've always been a maverick. Duh, maybe I'm being a little too hard on old Gare. Maybe later in the interview, he, uh, he brings up his own experiences. Did any of the people you interviewed see anybody in control of these craft? See any not in this, not in these cases, but I, in the injury cases, I do know of cases, non-injury associated where things were seen. What kind of things? Uh, little beings. I, I don't know what to say. I know it sounds crazy. I'm just, I don't I'm know just what to say. Like yeah. what, what the eyewitness accounts say. Yeah, the eyewitness I mean, You're accounts, not ratifying this. I'm not ratifying it. No, the sure. eyewitnesses always talk about something about that tall, right, with... You know, they call them the grays. I don't know what to but say. But with humanoid features. Humanoid features. Now, I have a problem with humanoid features. I have a problem with you having seen them and pretending like, I don't know what to say. This is kind of embarrassing. Um, and then he'll go on and say that, oh, by the way, his problem with the humanoid features, 
you know, has to do with maybe it's AI or robots or something, because anything can evolve into sentience. Why not an octopus? Why wouldn't they be octopus people? Well, Gary, I'll tell you why, because the Simpsons already did that. Um, but anyway, are you getting the point here? Old Gare is being a little coy. And actually, let's keep going with this just a little bit longer, because we're going to tie this up to something in a bit. One of my backgrounds is evolutionary biology. Yes. And so I don't see the possibility of something else evolving on another planet that looks like us. You know, unless God is intervening in very specific yes. ways. Almost anything, an octopus could become intelligent and fly around. The yes. Universe. So I think that part of what we're seeing here, I mean, look, if you're an intelligence, are you going to go down on a planet with a bunch of angry monkeys? who might kill you? No, unlikely. You'll send some intermediary. Well, what kind of intermediary are you going to send? You're going to send something that maybe almost looks like them, but isn't them. So I think, and this is, again, from inside the intelligence community, most of what we think we're seeing are avatars, biological robots. This is from within the intelligence community? Surely Tucker won't just let that slide that are basically put there to be the minions, if you will. And that's, that's the current view of that's the intel a, community. That is a, it is a hypothesis. It's, I mean, to me, if I were going to another place, or if, if I were going to study a native tribe of, let's say, cannibals, maybe I wouldn't show up in the middle of their village so that I don't, inadvertently become dinner. Yes. Right? So you would send an intermediary first. But I've used this example. Uh, I, I don't know if you know Lex Fridman. You probably know Lex Fridman. The, he's an interviewer. Oh, he's going to let it go. Okay. Um, well, I don't want to let this go because I found this, uh, this article here on Fox, funny enough, foxnews.com from 2023, from May 2023, aliens, quote, have been on Earth a long time, end quote, Stanford professor. Dr. Gary Nolan made the bold statements during last week's SALT Eye Connections conference in Manhattan during a session called The Pentagon Extraterrestrial Intelligence and Crashed UFOs. The host, Alex Klokas, Klokas, said that's tough to believe and asked him to assign a probability to the statement that extraterrestrial life visited Earth. 100%, Nolan responded. I think it's an advanced form of intelligence that, using some kind of, that is using some kind of intermediaries, Nolan said. It's not that they walk among us wearing a skin suit. You're going to put something there that I think of as an intelligence test. A little later, he says, quote, they're showing up and saying, who among you are intelligent enough to realize what it is you're looking at? Can you see what's in front of you for what it really is? Can you see the anomalous data point? So here he's adamant. It's 100% aliens. And all throughout this interview, you can t watch him talk about, it's a hypothesis. I don't know. This is what people say. Uh, my, 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 how things have changed in a year. Because this Tucker interview is 2022 and, and this foxnews.com piece is 2023. What changed? <laughs> I just, uh, so I find that problematic, but, but enough about that. Enough about that. I'm on a mission. I'm on a mission to find out if he ever tells Tucker any of his experiences or all of his experiences. He is a disclosure advocate after all, right? I mean, this to me is the bottom line. You're a disclosure advocate and you don't want to really disclose anything here on your big interview. Uh, that might say... I don't know, inform us to just how real this is for you. But anyway, uh, I have found it. Here it is. And for many people, it, you call them experiencers or you see something like that. I mean, I saw something when I was very young, when I was 12 as a paper boy, went right over my head. And what I, did you see? Where were you? This is Connecticut. What town? Uh, Windsor. I know it. Yeah, you went to Trinity. Outside Hartford, yeah. Yeah. Windsor, uh, Windsor Locks. Windsor Locks. And uh, it was early in the morning. I was delivering newspapers. I was walking through the woods between one street and another. The Hartford Current? Hartford Current. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and uh, 
uh, going from one street to another through the woods, and this I saw the lights. It was like March. Uh, the tree branches and my shadow in front of me, and then the shadow started moving, and I looked up, and this object went, I mean, right at the level of the top of the trees, went right over my head. Uh, with lights shining down, it was, I could kind of see the outline of something round. Uh, How big no was it? No sign, probably 30, 40 feet across. Wow. And, I mean, it was unmistakable. I wasn't dreaming, I wasn't asleep, etc. But, I didn't call it a UFO, I didn't know what it was. I just didn't know what it was. And it wasn't until a decade or so later when, you know, you start seeing movies, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, that kind of stuff. I thought, is that what I saw? You know, you look back retrospectively and say... But you, you never know, forgot it. I never forgot. No, it's one of those moments. And that, yeah, thank you. That was actually the point I was, I was trying to get to. When you see something like that, you never forget it. It is, it is, it changes your life. I hate to call it, it's almost like a spiritual experience. But you know what you do forget about? You forget about that time you were like four or five years old and like aliens walked into your bedroom, right? And then in a bookstore, you saw Streamer's Communion and you were like, God, give me help. You know, forget about that. I mean, this didn't inform you, huh? This was just like, you don't forget about it, but it doesn't inform anything you do. You just happened to end up working on a Stephen Greer documentary and just happened to have ex-CIA guys and corporate guys walking into your office to look at M UFO MRI stuff that I'm grossly unqualified to even articulate out loud in words that humans use, especially English-speaking humans. Hey, what happened to the metametals? That's kind of why I wanted to watch this interview. I just assumed there'd be a thing about metametals. Because, you know, his whole thing after the Atacama thing was, uh, as far as I knew, which isn't much, because like I said, I don't pay attention, but uh, metametals! So similarly, I look at these materials, and I do have some public materials, and I say, if I can understand these at the atomic level and understand how these things are put together, I might not understand how anti-gravity works, but I can now bring in scientists who might be experts in the kinds of atoms that are there and say, tell me what this might have been used for, because this is where it came from. And that's it. That's all he said about metamaterials. It was just in passing. I, I, I got some of these materials. Um, so why is it that I think, like, he's more important to that story? And that that story is more important than... I don't know. This, maybe? Maybe it's because when I do Google searches for, like, Gary Nolan and metamaterials, you get the flashy headlines of, uh, you know, he says they're aliens, he's looking at UFO debris, you know? Like, these are the headlines. And so you put these things together and you think, like, um, here's a guy who's got something. He's not telling Tucker. <laughs> he's not alluding to anything other than being a scientist. But, like, I'm sure that this, the Daily Star in the UK, I'm sure, you know, I don't know anything about this. It sounds like a rag, <laughs> so it probably is. It sounds like the National Enquirer here in the United States, but I don't know. But either way, the article is entitled, uh, Scientist has pieces of metal from UFO crash that simply do not, uh, that simply don't occur in nature. That sounds like that would be worth, um you know, a little more than just uh, coughing into your fist as you say, I have, you know, some materials that are in the public. Um, and by the way, if they were real UFO materials, why would they be in the public? Uh, they would immediately be confiscated. Anyway, this article is from uh, September 2023. So between 2022, again, and 2023, uh, the metamaterials become more important. He's 100% certain that this is aliens using, you know, probably AI to come in you know, I don't know, test the waters. Um, although I don't know how long you have to do that if they've been around with us for um, a super long time. <laughs> how long do you have to, to test the waters and see whether or not you want to introduce yourselves to us? But anyway, in this, and this isn't a complaint so much about Gary Nolan. It is in a roundabout way. It's more about the media. The media is lazy. 
and that and we're lazy readers and so between the two um it's very easy to gaslight us into believing we think we know what gary nolan is saying or people like him um because here the the tagline is stanford university expert gary nolan now he's an expert in immunology but they have him as an expert says he has analyzed fragments from an alleged ufo incident in brazil and says that they were definitely manufactured the only question is by whom so again of you know i have asked before what does gary nolan do and people are like no 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 he's giving the medals to someone else who's more qualified to examine the medals then why do they have him and again i'm sure that this is a rag and you know may, maybe it is i don't want to besmirch the star if they're not uh but uh, either way it doesn't matter because this is the stuff that you're going to find at the top of your google search when you plug in his name and meta materials you're going to find that he is an expert from Stanford and that he has analyzed the fragments of a UFO incident from Brazil and says that they were definitely manufactured. And then we just can't tell by whom. And again, in the first line of the article, a leading Stanford university expert has revealed that. So again, he's an expert. Like if you're a scientist, you can be a scientist of everything. That's the beauty of saying I'm a scientist. Uh, and we're just lazily supposed to accept it. We're not supposed to be like, well, wait, did you get your doctorate in history or literature? Or are you a medical doctor? Or what particular expertise? What, what segment of the medical world? You know, there are all these um, specifics that we never get into. We just say, like, leading expert from a university, and that's supposed to trigger in our head, oh, we need to pay attention to this. Well, he's revealed he has fragments from a suspected UFO that could not be naturally occurring material. And this is where they say, he said that uh, there wasn't conclusive evidence that the magnesium bismuth fragments shown by DeLong's To The Stars organization, Tom DeLong, right? He's the drummer from Blink-182. Uh, another well-qualified expert. He's saying there wasn't conclusive evidence that they were definitely from an extraterrestrial spacecraft. Quote, it does have slightly altered magnesium ratios, Dr. Nolan admitted. I've looked at that myself, but they're not so far off that they can't be construed as some other sort of reason for, and there's some typos here, uh, in the making of it. In, in, the, in the making of it. Well, okay. Anyway, you get it. It can be construed that there's some terrestrial origin story for these metals. However, he said on Dr. Keating's podcast, the fragments from an explosion in the sky over... Ubatuba in Brazil's, uh, geez, there's a lot of typos, in Sao Paulo province in September 1957 were much more interesting. And then they go into the uh, flying disc exploded story. Analysis found that the fragments of magnesium again were of a purity that simply doesn't occur in nature. Dr. Nolan added, quote, I have been given pieces of material from the, oh God, this is a rag. Whether you're a rag or not, you need an editor. From the so-called Yuba Tuba event, uh, we did do a very detailed analysis using secondary ion mass spec of the isotope ratios of two pieces. Now, who's we? Right? Like Dr. Gary Nolan, who is not a metallurgist, who does immunology, and who else? We did it in the same instrument uh at the same time under the same vacuum conditions one piece had perfectly conventional magnesium ratios the other were the other were way off the only thing i can imagine is that it was manufactured um i mean so that doesn't prove it's a uap dr nolan added that doesn't prove it was alien dot 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 it just says to me somebody back in the in the 50s spent a lot of money to change the isotope ratios and then blew it up over a beach in brazil so the only question that raises to me is, who would do that? And why would they do it? Well, the question it raises to me, Jeremy Vaney, here in 2024 is, what's your expertise in this? Thankfully, I don't have to wait long, because uh, Google is still my friend. I can find out what his expertise is, because I have found, that's right, his peer-reviewed paper from sciencedirect.com. It is improved instrumental techniques, including isotopic analysis applicable to the characterizations of unusual materials within potential relevance to aerospace forensics. Uh, 
that's that's a mouthful. This is a paper by Gary Nolan, Jacques Vallée. I'm going to mispronounce this and I apologize. Sijuan Zhang and Larry Lemke. It's sort of saying something-ish, but nothing you can hang your hat on. Nothing that's the real, you know. As me old friend Tyler Kochan would say, again, the Nobel Prize uh, has been ignored. These people who make these great claims keep not quite reaching for the Nobel Prize. Uh, when they, if you've got the meta medals, let's go for the big one, shall we? You're a doctor. Um, but, oh, wait a minute. There's something else weird about this. Uh, oh. Well, this was published January 1st, 2022? Huh. So, wait a minute. Let me go back here. The Tucker Carlson thing is from March 2022. So, why did he just skip over the Meta Metals thing when this massive paper with these people signed off on it actually came out? Why didn't he even mention the paper? Why? He didn't mention the Atacama thing in 2012. He just glazed right over that. In fact, he pushed back when these people showed up in his office with MRIs or whatnot to 2011, which apparently isn't true. It was 2013. And now <laughs> we've got this this monumental paper on the meta metals that they could be talking about all hour. And it just gets a passing, passing mention. Could it be because nothing came of these meta metals? Oh, wait, except... Uh, Later in 2023, there's all kinds of articles about the metamedals, you know, and he's being quoted as saying this is all 100 percent alien. Uh, you know, like. I'm just saying, folks, there's something fishy here. There's something fishy, as in there is a narrative being built and he's editing out the parts that he thinks don't fit. This is what it seems like to me, in my opinion. And why is my opinion important, if only to me, because he's, he's so, so vague. Correct. Uh, so if you're gonna, if you're, if you're gonna edit out what you think are your failures or trim the fat, as it were, and you're just going to keep sticking with the thing that's still sort of anomalous, which is this idea of these people in some sort of official capacity coming to you with these, you know, uh, effects of UFOs. Metamedals isn't panning out. The alien mummy isn't panning out. But we still have this. How certain are you and why are you certain if you have zero interest in ufology uh, that this is 100% alien and it's probably AI doing this? Like, if everything keeps not panning out... <laughs> Eventually, I'd be like, eh, there's nothing to see here. But not Gary Gary Nolan. Um, could it be because he is an experiencer? And, and so he knows on a deeper level that this is real, but he's looking for the proof in the material world, which is not where it exists. Could that be what's going on here? I think that's possible. Um, I think it's also possible that he's um, just trying to co-create the narrative since 2017 on the scholarly level that mirrors the military level and the um, Jeremy Corbell level of like, we're just to look at UFOs and, and stuff from this point on. We're not to look backwards. Um, but then all of our questions will come from that. In other words, if you've got meta metals, and you're pretending that nothing before the metamedals existed, then you can theorize that maybe there are these gray beings are here and they're AI and they're just looking at us with an avatar, as he claims the military says is true, uh, that, that that's what they're doing to study us so that we have a sense of familiarity with them. Well, then... That would make sense if they only appeared here in 2017. No, your metal medals have appeared since since 2017, but not the arc of ufology, right? So arguably, this has been around since before us. It's at least been around since us. Quick note. In this interview, Gary did talk about aliens potentially having been here since ye olden days. Tis true. However, such musings are utterly forgettable, 
because the meta context of all this meta material in the interview is that we are not to examine anything prior to, well, 2013, or is it 2012, or maybe 2011? The jury is still out on the exact date. The point is, referencing the ancient past while continuously stressing that we must stay in the present causes a kind of fog, a kind of cognitive dissonance in viewers that keeps us from even thinking to ask questions like, how long do aliens need to keep sending avatars to keep doing the same sorts of things uh, to figure out those specific questions that they have about us? Um, do they care about other organisms on the planet or just us? And is it just Americans? Because Americans are the ones who see the greys the most out of anyone in the world. So what's that about? You know, these are the kinds of questions that are the actual will, if you ask them enough to yourself, will lead to the deeper thinking about these subjects because the, the, the surface level will reveal itself to be just that, a surface level. And underneath there are some bigger questions. And we're never going to get to those if we're go allowing ourselves to reset ufology to 2017 because that's what the lazy media push is at the behest of scholars like this, military people like that, Bigelow over there, Jeremy Corbell and his mansion, you know, um, people re-upping the cottage industry and getting funding for projects and, you know, go down the list of reasons that they would want to do this. Um, I just think that the simplest answer for me is that Gary Nolan fits into that group of people. Um, but again, I don't know. Never even spoken to the guy. I just know that I had a bunch of questions um, for him. And in fact, maybe I'll end on one that my friend who got me to do this episode, unbeknownst to him, um, asked, which is this. Puzzled. So after decades of deception, apparently as official policy, how does Gary Nolan or anyone else cut through the deceptions, con jobs, disinformation, etc., to reach and reveal the final glorious truth that the 2023 Defense Department budget mandated? If, quote unquote, they were afraid of public reaction before, why are we to believe they will be truth tellers now? Great question. I, uh, I wish I cared anymore to get an answer. I'm just done with these people. He's but wait, hold that thought. I'm not done with these people yet. Oh no, not by a long shot. Um, it's Jeremy from the future. It looks like 80, 90 years into the future for some reason, but it's actually just like a couple of days later. Uh, time travel. Uh, so next week I will be turning this into a trilogy by doing Jacques Vallée and Meta materials. Why not? Um, let's see what I have to say about my personal sacred cow. Uh, but more importantly for now, um, when I was talking about the Science Direct Gary Nolan paper, improved instrumental techniques included, uh, sorry, including isotopic analysis applicable to the characterization of unusual materials with potential relevance to aerospace forensics. Um, I was, uh, really talking about the, uh, summary article. Um, I didn't actually read the, I didn't realize that you could click a little button at the top and read the article article. Um, so I didn't do that. Um, but then I did, and this is what I found, which is code for, I still didn't, but my anonymous friend did, and this is what he wrote me. This is from the introduction to that paper. Quote, Notably, there were no significant isotopic differences from terrestrial normal in the subsamples, and thus the overall sample could have been made with terrestrial-derived materials. That said, the CB, and then underscore JV, no relation, hyphen one sample itself remains of unknown provenance or function. And then this is reiterated in the conclusion. And my friend says... Notwithstanding the hopeful spin of the second sentence above, without the review aspect, uh, looking at how one might examine an anomalous metal sample forensically, all they have produced is a confirmation of prior results, although using newer analytical tools. 
There's not much novelty in confirming a metal sample found on Earth could have been made with materials from Earth. Um, without slanting this as a review article guide for future investigations of anomalous materials, the results are too limited and lack sufficient novelty to publish as a research report. A brilliant approach to get something on this material published in a peer-reviewed publication while offering little in the way of novel findings. Unless the group has more to reveal in future publications, Dr. Gary Nolan has pretty much tubed another wonderful fantasy. The most dangerous man in ufology strikes again. So, um, what all of that is saying is, in his Metametals report, with the other people involved, the other three names, um, so it's not just him, their conclusion, or one of their conclusions is like, yeah, this could have been made here on Earth, but we can't know what it does, what it's for. Well, of course not, because it's like a clump of, like, burned up <laughs> metal. It's, it doesn't look like a handle. It doesn't look like a button. You, you know, it's metal. Of course, you don't know what it was for, but that's not mysterious. But of course, you know, they're going to be able to use that if they so choose to, you know, presume that it's there's still a mystery here. We don't know what this is. We just know that it could have been made here. So case closed on the metamedals, right? Um, and this gets to what my friend here is saying, which is that he's the most dangerous man in ufology because he did debunk um, the ADA, uh, or, you know, I don't know if is debunk the right word. I mean, he, he researched it and found that it was terrestrial. He looked at, um, the, to the stars Academy meta materials and found that it was likely terrestrial. And now he's looking at this and finding it's likely terrestrial. So that's all great news. We now have our answers, but he didn't say this on Tucker's show. He, as I said, did the equivalent of coughing into his hand and saying, right, I've sort of looked at public materials and talks about it in sort of an abstract way of like, I can, I have the ability to get people who are experts to look at the isotopic ratios and the atoms and the buildup and blah. He's not saying, oh, by the way, earlier this year, I actually did that. And we found that our metamaterials from this uh, Brazil crash are uh, just kind of from around here. And then cut to 2023 and, you know, maybe earlier, you know, I'm just saying from my cursory examination here, you cut to 2023 and you see that there are still news articles and there probably still are in 2024 about how Gary Nolan is um, the scientist, the expert to go to who is working on the metal metals thing. So I my fear is that he has learned more from Stephen Greer than, than one would want, which is like, you know, pair this up with letting Tucker Carlson in his lazy, uninformed way talk about like CIA officials are showing up at your office. And Gary's like, yeah, I know. It's amazing, right? Like that becomes the story, not the fact that it was like a business guy and his, his friend and or uh, co-worker or, you know, underling, whatever he is, ex, who happens to be an ex-CIA person, you know, showing up. No, the story is like the Pentagon would like to see you, sir. And that's not the actual story of um, doing the blood work for, you know, people who have had ill effects after UFO encounters. Um, so he's allowing the ignorance of the media and the inference and the withholding of certain information. He's doing all of this. And the, the outcome, whether it's conscious or not, is that Gary Nolan makes a name for himself whether he has debunked these things or not. That's not the important thing. But that should be the important thing, Gary Nolan. So here's my plea to you. I believe one thing about you, outside of your education and the provable stuff, that you are a lifelong experiencer. I don't think a UFO hovers over the treetops and shines a light on you, and that's not about you. And I don't think you have that experience at like five or six years old. And you can just say like, these two things are maybe unrelated. Maybe that was a brain chemistry issue or a bad dream or something. I don't, th I'm not saying he's saying that. I'm saying you can't say that when you give the second one and the visceral reaction you had to seeing Streber's cover. So I do tend to think that like you're in this because you're an experiencer and you're looking in the wrong places for your answers for what this could be. And every time that you debunk something or you come to like this, okay, this is likely or conclusively not alien, not anything 
other than terrestrial, um, still you seem to be doubling down on, but this is 100% alien and the intelligence community seems to think it's AI or what, like all that nonsense. It, who cares? Stop following that, that, that breadcrumb trail to nowhere. You know, I mean, yeah, you, you may be like the famous guy amongst the nerds, <laughs> right? Like, like the white guys with the bad breath who you have to have dinner with now and tell these stories to, I mean, maybe that's your thing. Maybe that's all you want, but if you want more, <laughs> realize what you're actually debunking is not just these metamaterials one after the other and not just the out of comma skeleton but the materiality of this phenomenon as the central focal point because that's what the focus has been since 2017 right and indeed that's what and that's the narrative that he plays into uh, and that is, um, I think what he wants to try to find out of this, at least at the behest of these people who want to use it, be they military or aerospace Bigelow people, um, they want to find, you know, they want to put it into the capitalist machine and spin out products. And if that's who you are, Gary Nolan, um, as an experiencer, if that's what the sum total of your life experiences have led you to be, and that's the depth that you see in the subject that has so profoundly affected you, and in fact predicted you, uh, look again, because that ain't it. You're not filling that hole inside. This is my plea, experiencer to experiencer here. I know this, this is stupid. <laughs> it's falling on deaf ears, probably never going to see this, but... Uh, just in case, just that, just sit with that, how none of this materiality stuff is panning out and why, and stop doubling down on, therefore it's hundred percent alien. Because if I say that, if I get enough headlines out there and, uh, and I obfuscate my background and I pick and choose what I want to present myself as to which public I'm talking to, um, so that there just creates this myth of a Gary Nolan, um, who then gets speaking gigs or whatever it is, um, that ain't it. And that's fine if you're not an experiencer, but if you are, you know that you've got to be truthful with this stuff. Um, like that's your mandate, man. That's it. Your mandate is to be honest. So start being honest. He's, He's so, so vague.